Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 6, Painting the Figures from Avalon Hill's Hero Quest. In this episode, we're going to be painting the Dread Sorcerer, which is the closest thing we've got to a character mini for the monsters, so we're going to be spending a bit more time on him. I'm also going to be checking out some of Scale Color's Metal and Alchemy paints, which I'm really looking forward to using, as I've heard a lot of very good things about these. I realise, of course, that not all of you will have access to them though, so I've gone and taken the liberty of offering up some Citadel alternatives, and of course you can use any brand you like, but as always I'm using Citadel as they are the ones I have closest to hand. The preparation for the figure was done in exactly the same way as the Gargoyle, so I suggest you go back and watch that video if you want to know how. I then primed the figure in Mechanicus Standard Grey, before washing over it with some Nuln Oil as you can now see. This is so that we don't end up using multiple layers of spray paint, which might actually end up obscuring some of the detail within the actual figure, which is often a worry when you're doing a Xenophil Prime, such as you can see. We followed that up finally when that had dried with a spray of white from the direction of the hand in order to create more of an object source lighting effect. So kicking off the base coats, now I'll start with the skin, and in this case, Rakar Flesh. We'll thin this down as we usually do and apply two thin coats over all of the skin, including the arms, but we'll leave the outstretched hand which we're going to be adding the object source lighting effect to later on. Next we'll be moving on to the cloak where we'll be using an equal mix of petroleum grey and violet by scale colour. Now of course, if you're not using these particular paints, then a suitable alternative from Citadel would be something like Dryad Bark, mixed with perhaps some Eshin Grey and some Nagaroth Knight, and for the Violet, a pure Nagaroth Knight would be perfectly fine. We're going to use this to coat in all of the cloak in a couple of thin coats as before, and uh, yeah, just take your time, don't worry about being too neat, and uh, make sure you get a nice even coverage, so it might require two or three layers. We'll then follow that up by coating in the trim of the cloak with some graphene grey. Uh, again, another suitable Citadel alternative would be something like Mechanica Standard Grey mixed with a little Stegodon Scale Green. Now keep offering up Citadel alternatives because they are the line which is most widely available and it's the line that is pretty much dominating my desk if I'm not using Scale 75. But for those who know, I like using the Scale 75 paints because of the super matte finish they give. We're then going to switch to just using straight up violet for the undercloak and the centre of the body as well as for the purple areas of the adornment that's over his shoulders. Uh, again you haven't got to worry about being too neat here because we're going to be coming back with some metallic paint shortly. And I'll be using Doom Bull Brown for the small leather patches that are just underneath the adornment. I'm now kicking off with the first of my new golds, and that's going to be Elven Gold, which I'm going to be using mainly on the adornment trims and maybe on the bracelets as well, although I might use the Dwarven Gold for this. Uh, I can already report that I'm absolutely loving these paints. The pigment is so much finer than the Citadel ones, and they certainly do paint on in a much, much nicer way, much better for layering and such. I'm then going to be switching over to the Viking Gold, which is more of a burnished orangey gold, very similar to Retributor Armour. I'm going to be using this for the medallions on the adornment and also for the crown. I'm just touching in a bit I missed with the Elven Gold. I'm then going to be using the Dwarven Gold for the head of the staff, as well as for the bracelet, which is what I did decide to do with that one in the end, as it's got a slightly more orangey tone, and there's more of a mid, mid gold between the Elven and the Viking Gold. I'm then going to start coating in the silver with black metal, although something like lead belts would be equally fine to use here, 
and that's just for the small tooth on the adornment and the chains around the doom ball brown leather. Hopefully you can also see a vast improvement in the lighting here too as I've now finally got a decent light for filming these videos. And we'll follow that up by coating in the staff with some Rhinox hide before then mixing it with a little bit of the Viking gold which we'll use as a base for the chain around the adornment and the more coppery effects that we might want to build up later. This is the Viking Gold and the Rhinox Hide mix. Finally, I'm going to coat the outstretched hand in pure white in order to give it a nice bright base coat ready for our optic source lighting spell effect that we'll be adding later on. With that done, he's now ready for some shades. For that putrid undead flesh look that's on the character art, I'm going to be using Bealtan's green on all the skin, followed by a Reichland flesh shade on some of the golden -y parts, and an Agrax earth shade on the others like the head of the staff and the doom ball brown areas. So here you can see that I'm just applying the Bealtan green to the skin, and I'm going to do this over all of the flesh, avoiding the actual bright hand that we recently painted in white. I'll then be using the Reichland Flesh Shade just to coat in the medallions on the adornment and also the small ring that is hanging from the base of it. And we'll follow that up with using the Agrax Earth Shade on the whole of the staff, both wood and gold, as well as the crown and the Doom Ball Brown leather sections upon his front person, <laughs> if you can say that about an undead sorcerer. Just remember when doing all of these shades to be a bit mindful of the pooling and if you see any particularly large areas with too much shade in them to just wick them away with the tip of your brush. To kick off the highlights I'm going to start doing the spell effect using some scale colour fuchsia mixed with some titanium white from Schmincke which will then glaze some fluorescent magenta over. So here you can see me just mixing the white and the fuchsia together and now just applying it gently over the hand in order to create a sense of where the light is actually going to be cast from and just how saturated it's going to be. A suitable alternative for the fuchsia would be something like Scream of Pink mixed with some Pink Horror. And followed that you can see that I'm now just glazing some of the fluorescent magenta over the hand so that I can really get a sense of just how bright this is all going to be when it comes to adding the lighting and the saturated highlights later on. And while that's drying this is as good a time as any to add some astrogranite to the flat parts of the base which is still showing. Following that, I'm then going to start highlighting up the violet areas using our violet, coming back with some white sands then mixed into it, and then when it comes to the eyes, I'm going to be adding some sunset purple. Now we want to be adding the violet to ever decreasing areas of the raised edges of this violet space. Violet space, is that the right word? I don't know. Um, I'm also using this to paint in the eye sockets though, as you can see here. And you've just got to be very, very careful and be a little bit mindful of getting any of it onto our skin tones while we're going about it. And don't forget to pick out the raised edges on the back as well. So here I'm just building the highlights on the robes by picking out the raised edges and the brighter edges with a mix of the white sands and violet paint. Uh, white sands would be a suitable alternative of white mixed with uh, some Screaming Skull, whereas in the eye socket I'm just applying some Sunset Purple, which again would be something like Naga, oh, Xerus Purple probably, mixed with some Screamer Pink. Uh, finally, I'm just going to dot some small whites into the centre of the eye sockets. Now this next section is actually where I was highlighting up the metallics and using some of these new uh, Scale Color 75 paints from the Metal and Alchemy set, and I've come to a couple of conclusions to this. I'm not actually going to go into any detail about how I went over doing this because at the end of the day, in this particular figure and how I went about it, it wasn't really worth the effort. 
uh, the miniature was so small that the highlights were pretty much lost but I can definitely say from the other part of my conclusion is that these paints are fantastic and totally worth using and if you can get hold of the citrine alchemy paint which is the brighter whiter one it's certainly worth using it we're then going to come back to highlighting up the flesh where we'll come back with our base tone of rakar flesh building it up with some flayed one flesh and then some pallid witch flesh and here you can see i'm just thinning the rakar flesh down before picking out all of the raised edges keeping it thin so that we can see some of that green undertone that we shaded in oh coming through and we, as you can see, I'm just drawing the paint up towards the brightest parts of the skin, leaving the green to really show in the deepest recesses. This is now me thinning the flayed one flesh down, and I'm going to keep applying these highlights, trying to focus more towards the left of the actual figure's face, your right as you're looking at it, because that area I want to particularly saturate so that when we do glaze over the object source lighting later, that's really going to help that to stand out and really make it pop upon the figure. And this is our brightest highlight of the pallid witch flesh. Again, we'll be focusing around that eye socket, but we can pick out a few areas on the other cheekbones as well, as well as the knuckles and fingertips, just to um, really help to sell and accentuate the body of this actual figure. I'm now going to start highlighting the Doom Ball brown leather areas by adding increasing amounts of our pallid witch flesh to the mix. I'll then come back with some speed metal to pick out the silver areas, but something like Stormhose Silver mixed with a little bit of I don't know, white scar or something would be perfectly acceptable for this. So here you can see that I'm just picking out the main areas, leaving the darkest edges um, of the Doom Mold Brown before mixing in some of the pallid witch flesh and focusing it more towards the edges and the very tips of the um, leather uh, patches. Patches, yeah, we'll call them patches. And here we're just picking out the silver chain links. I'm now going to start highlighting up the cloak, starting from our base tone mix and then adding increasing amounts of Tanir yellow, or something like Uriel yellow would do here, followed by increasing the saturation with some white sands towards the end. As you can see, I'm now adding the uh, Tanir yellow into the mix, and we'll be focusing this again on the raised folds and edges, mainly where the light will be hitting, so we'll definitely be utilising any photographs that we've got of the Xenophil Prime that we did earlier on. Now, of course, we, as we know, we focused most of the main brightness of that Xenophil Prime more towards the arm and the hand, which is outstretched for the spell effect. So that's where we're gonna, really going to be aiming to build the saturation on top of these folds and we're going to take that really quite bright which is what the white sands is going to help us to achieve because once that is heavily saturated it's far easier to then glaze over a color when make that actually show especially against the darker uh, base tone such as we have here So here you can see that I'm now adding some of that white sand into our mix and we're going to be using this to really push up the brightness along the edge of the hood and, and particularly to the areas where the hand is going to be um, casting the main areas of light where it's going to be hitting. And you can see that I'm stippling some of this onto the cloak to create a sense of texture on it as well because we have to bear in mind that this is a cloak made of a cloth not a leather so it's not going to be overly reflective. But again, we do want to somehow help boost the vibrancy of this object source lighting when we add it. With our cloak now highlighted, we can finish off by highlighting up the trim, going back to our graphene grey and adding some arctic blue into the mix, something like ulfuran grey perhaps. Then we'll highlight up the staff with some gorefall brown, followed by some baneblade brown. So here you can see that I'm just adding the arctic blue into the graphene grey and we'll just use this to build some of the main areas of light and shadow, keeping the deepest areas darkest and using some of it as an edge highlight as we get towards some of our brighter tones. I chose to use the arctic blue here as the sort of colder blue coming through on the grey will help to sort of contrast nicely against the warm pinks we're going to be getting from the spell effects.
here I decide to add a little bit of the white sands into the mix until in order to really push up the saturation of some of those highlights and to give us some really nice bright points on the edges. I'm now going to be picking out all of the raised edges as, long, as well as the main area of the staff with the Gore 4 Brown. Before then coming back with some Bane Blade Brown to really pick out the edge highlights. With our figure now almost complete, it's time to start glazing over some more of the fluorescent magenta. And here we're going to thin it down as we did before, and then gently start to glaze some of it across the arms. Now you want to get nearly all of this out of your bristles so that it's almost dry as you, gen as you then start to apply it to the figure. And it's easier if you start drawing it towards the main source of the light, therefore you don't end up with some strange pooling effects or saturation in areas where the light wouldn't be hitting. Now you'll probably need to do this in two or three layers, but you have to leave plenty of time between each layer to dry and then definitely apply it to a smaller area when you come for the next level of saturation. But take your time and work across the mini like this. I then came back to the actual textured surface while I was waiting for those layers to dry and just dry brushed some pallid witch flesh over it. Before then applying a bit of null oil in order to darken that down. And I even then decided to glaze a little bit more of the pink down across that to let the light look like it was actually casting right down the left hand side of the body. I then came back and ended up painting the rim of the base in black as we usually do in a couple of thin coats and here you can see that I'm just applying yet another glaze as I keep trying to build that saturation on the figure. Once we're happy with the look of the effect and it's all dried off, we can come back and give them a coat in ultramat varnish. And so this completes our Dread Sorcerer. And as always, you'll find a full list of the paints used on your screen now, although the ones with asterisks are the metallics that I would deem not necessary to really be used on this particular figure. I just really enjoyed having a play around with them. If you did enjoy the video though, then please do hit that like button and subscribe for all of my future content. And as always, you can find PDF guides on my Facebook and Instagram pages. But until next time, bye for now.